Good evening. This is Pat Tully of the Catch Can Public Library, and this is Reading Aloud. This evening, on the eve of the 4th of July, I will be reading a few letters between Abigail and John Adams, written in 1776. That year, the colonies and the Adamses were not only facing a war with England, but also an outbreak of smallpox in the colonies. So let's get started. To Abigail from John Adams, Philadelphia, 29th of March, 1776. I give you joy of Boston and Charleston, once more the habitation of Americans. I am waiting with great impatience for letters from you, which I know will contain many particulars. We are taking precautions to defend every place that is in danger, the Carolinas, Virginia, New York, Canada. I can think of nothing but fortifying Boston Harbor. I want more cannon than are to be had. I want a fortification upon Point Alderton, one upon Lovell's Island, one upon George's Island, several upon Long Island, and one upon the moon, one upon Squantum. I want to hear of half a dozen fire ships and two or three hundred fire rafts prepared. I want to hear of row galleys, floating batteries built, and booms laid across the channel in the Narrows, and the Freseau de Frise sunk in it. I want to hear that you are translating Braintree Commons into the channel. No efforts, no expense are too extravagant for me to wish for, to fortify that harbor so as to make it impregnable. I hope everybody will join and work until it is done. We have this week lost a very valuable friend of the colonies in Governor Ward of Rhode Island by the smallpox in the natural way. He never would hearken to his friends who have been constantly advising him to be inoculated ever since the first Congress began. But he would not be persuaded. Numbers who have been inoculated have gone through this December without any danger or even confinement, but nothing would do. He must take it in the natural way and die. He was an amiable and sensible man, a steadfast friend to his country upon very pure principles. His funeral was attended with the same solemnities as Mr. Randolph's. Mr. Stillman, being an Anabaptist minister here, of which persuasion was the governor, was desired by the Congress to preach a sermon, which he did with great applause. Remember me as you ought. To Abigail, from John Adams, Philadelphia, 3rd of July, 1776. Had a Declaration of Independency been made seven months ago, it would have been attended with a great many and glorious effects. We might, before this hour, have formed alliances with foreign states. We should have mastered Quebec and been in possession of Canada. You will perhaps wonder how such a declaration would have influenced our affairs in Canada, but if I could write with freedom, I could easily convince you that it would, and explain to you the manner how. Many gentlemen in high stations and of great influence have been duped by the ministerial bubble of commissioners to treat. And in real sincere expectation of this event, which they so fondly wished, they have been slow and languid in promoting measures for the reduction of that province. Others there are in the colonies who really wish that our enterprise in Canada would be defeated, that the colonies might be brought into danger and distress between two fires and be thus induced to submit. Others really wish to defeat the expedition to Canada, lest the conquest of it should elevate the minds of the people too much to hearken to those terms of reconciliation which, they believed, would be offered us. These jarring views, wishes, and designs occasioned an opposition to many salutary measures which were proposed for the support of that expedition, and caused obstructions, embarrassments, and studied delays which have finally lost us the province. All these causes, however, in conjunction would not have disappointed us if it had not been for a misfortune which could not be foreseen and perhaps could not have been prevented. 
I mean the prevalence of the smallpox among our troops. This fatal pestilence completed our destruction. It is a frown of providence upon us, which we ought to lay to heart. But on the other hand, the delay of this declaration to this time has a great many advantages attending it. The hopes of reconciliation, which were fondly entertained by multitudes of honest and well-meaning, though weak and mistaken people, have been gradually and at last totally extinguished. Time has been given for the whole people maturely to consider the great question of independence and to ripen their judgment, dissipate their fears, and allure their hopes by discussing it in newspapers and pamphlets, by debating it in assemblies, conventions, committees of safety and inspection, in town and county meetings, as well as in private conversations, so that the whole people in every colony of the Thirteen have now adopted it as their own act. This will cement the Union and avoid those heats and perhaps convulsions which might have been occasioned by such a declaration six months ago. But the day is past. The second day of July, 1776, will be the most memorable epoch in the history of America. I am apt to believe that it will be celebrated by succeeding generations as the great anniversary festival. It ought to be commemorated as the day of deliverance by solemn acts of devotion to God Almighty. It ought to be solemnized with pomp and parade, with shows, games, sports, guns, bells, bonfires, and illuminations from one end of this continent to the other, from this time forward forevermore. You will think me transported with enthusiasm, but I am not. I am well aware of the toil and blood and treasure that it will cost us to maintain this declaration and support and defend these states. Yet, through all the gloom, I can see the rays of ravishing light and glory. I can see that the end is more than worth all the means, and that posterity will triumph in that day's transaction, even though we should rue it, which I trust in God we will not. To Abigail from John Adams, Philadelphia, 11th of July, 1776. You seem to be situated in the place of greatest tranquility and security of any upon the continent. I may be mistaken in this particular, and an armament may have invaded your neighborhood before now, but we have no intelligence of any such design, and all that we now know of the motions, plans, operations, and designs of the enemy indicates the contrary. It is but just that you should have a little rest and take a little breath. I wish I knew whether your brother and mine have enlisted in the army, and what spirit is manifested by our militia for marching to New York and Crown Point. The militia of Maryland, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and the lower counties are marching with much alacrity and a laudable zeal to take care of Howe and his army at Staten Island. The army in New York is in high spirits and seems determined to give the enemy a serious reception. The unprincipled and unfeeling and unnatural inhabitants of Staten Island are cordially receiving the enemy and, deserters say, have engaged to take up arms. They are an ignorant, cowardly pack of scoundrels. Their numbers are small and their spirit less. It is some time since I received any letter from you. The Plymouth one was the last. You must write me every week by the post if it is but a few lines. It gives me many spirits. I design to write to the general court requesting a demission or at least a furlough. I think to propose that they choose four more members or at least three more so that we may attend here in rotation. Two or three or four may be at home at a time and the colony properly represented notwithstanding. Indeed, while the Congress were employed in political regulations, forming the sentiments of the people of the colonies into some consistent system, extinguishing the remainders of authority under the crown and gradually erecting and strengthening governments under the authority of the people, turning their thoughts upon the principles of polity and the forms of government, framing constitutions for the colonies separately, and a limited and defined confederacy for the United Colonies 
and in some other measures, which I do not choose to mention particularly, but which are now determined or near the point of determination, I flattered myself that I might have been some little use here. But now these matters will soon be completed, and very little business will be done here but what will either be either military or commercial. Branches of knowledge and business for which hundreds of others in our province are much better qualified than I am. I shall therefore request my masters to relieve me. I am not a little concerned about my health, which seems to have been providentially preserved to me, much beyond my expectations. But I begin to feel the disagreeable effects of unremitting attention to business for so long a time, and a want of exercise, and the bracing quality of my native air, so that I have the utmost reason to fear an irreparable injury to my constitution if I do not obtain a little relaxation. The fatigues of war are much less destructive to health than the painful, laborious attention to debates and to writing which drinks up the spirits and consumes the strength, etc. To John, from Abigail Adams, Boston, 13th of July, 1776. I must begin with apologizing to you for not writing since the 17th of June. I have really had so many cares upon my hands and mind, with a bad inflammation in my eyes, that I have not been able to write. I now date from Boston where I yesterday arrived and was with all of our little ones inoculated for the smallpox. As to news, we have taken several prizes since I wrote you, as you will see by the newspapers. The present report is of Lord Howe's coming with unlimited powers. However, suppose it is so, I believe he little thinks of treating with us as independent states. How can any person yet dream of a settlement, accommodations, etc.? They have neither the spirit nor the feeling of men. Yet I see some who were never called Tories gratified with the idea of Lord Howe's being upon his passage with such powers. Sunday, 14th of July. By yesterday's post, I received two letters dated the 3rd and 4th of July, and though your letters never fail to give me pleasure, be the subject what it will, yet it was greatly heightened by the prospect of the future happiness and glory of our country. Nor am I a little gratified when I reflect that a person so nearly connected with me has had the honor of being a principal actor in laying a foundation for its future greatness. May the foundation of our new constitution be justice, truth, righteousness. Like the wise man's house, may it be founded upon these rocks, and then neither storms nor tempests will overthrow it. I cannot but be sorry that some of the most manly sentiments in the Declaration are expunged from the printed copy. Perhaps wise reasons induced it. I shall write you now very often. Pray inform me constantly of every important action. Every expression of tenderness is a cordial to my heart. Important as they are to the rest of the world, to me they are everything. I suppose you have heard of a fleet which came up pretty near the light and kept us all with our mouths open, ready to catch them, but after staying near a week and making what observations they could, set sail and went off to our great mortification, who were for them in every respect. If our ship of 32 guns, which was built at Portsmouth and waiting only for guns, and another at Portsmouth in the same state, had been in readiness we should, in all probability, have been masters of them. Where the bl blame lies in that respect, I know not. Tis laid upon Congress, and Congress is also blamed for not appointing us a general. But Rome was not built in a day. All our friends desire to be remembered to you, and foremost in that number stands your Portia. To Abigail, from John Adams, July 20th, 1776. I cannot omit the opportunity of writing you a line by this post. This letter will, I suppose, find you in some degree or other under the influence of the smallpox. The air is of very great importance. I don't know your physician, but I hope he won't deprive you of air more than is necessary. 
We had yesterday an express from General Lee in Charleston, South Carolina, with an account of a brilliant little action between the armament under Clinton in Cornwallis and a battery on Sullivan's Island, which terminated very fortunately for America. I will endeavor to enclose with this a printed account of it. It has given us good spirits here and will have a happy effect upon our armies at New York and Ticonderoga. Surely our northern soldiers will not suffer themselves to be outdone by their brethren so nearly under the sun. I don't yet hear of any Massachusetts men at New York. Our people must not flinch at this critical moment when their country is in more danger than it ever will be again, perhaps. What will they say if the house should prevail against our forces at so important a post as New York for the want of a few thousand men from Massachusetts? I will likewise send you by this post Lord Howe's letter and proclamation, which has let the cat out of the bag. These tricks deceive no longer. Gentlemen here who either were or pretended to be deceived heretofore, now see or pretend to see through such artifices. I apprehend his lordship is afraid of being attacked upon Staten Island and is throwing out his barrels to amuse Leviathan until his reinforcements shall arrive. July 20th. This has been a dull day to me. I waited the arrival of the post with much solicitude and impatience, but his arrival made me more solicitous still. To be left at the post office in your handwriting on the back of a few lines from the doctor was all I could learn of you and my little folks. If you were too busy to write, I hoped that some kind hand would have been found to let me know something about you. Do all my friends think that I have been a politician so long as to have lost all feeling? Do they suppose I have forgotten my wife and children? Or are they so panic-struck with the loss of Canada as to be afraid to correspond with me? Or have they forgotten that you have a husband and your children a father? What have I done or omitted to do that I should thus be thus forgotten and neglected in the most tender and affecting scenes of my life? Don't mistake me. I don't blame you. Your time and thoughts must have been wholly taken up with your own and your family's situation and necessities. But twenty other persons might have informed me. I suspect that you intended to have run slyly through the smallpox with the family without letting me know it, and then have sent me an account that you were all well. This might be a kind intention, and if the design had succeeded, would have made me very joyous. But the secret is out, and I am left to conjecture. But as the faculty have this distemper so much under command, I will flatter myself with the hope and expectation of soon hearing of your recovery. To John from Abigail Adams, Boston, 21st of July, 1776. I have no doubt but that my dearest friend is anxious to know how his Portia does and his little flock of children under the operation of a disease once so formidable. I have the pleasure to tell him that they are all comfortable, though some of them complaining. Nabby has been very ill, but the eruption begins to make its appearance upon her, and upon Johnny. Tommy is so well that the doctor inoculated him again today, fearing it hadn't taken. Charlie has no complaints yet, though his arm has been very sore. I have been out to meeting this forenoon, and have so many disagreeable sensations this afternoon that I thought it prudent to tarry at home. The doctor says these are very good feelings. Mr. Cranch has passed through the preparation, and the eruption is coming out cleverly upon him without any sickness at all. Mrs. Cranch is cleverly, and so are all her children. Those who are broke out are pretty full for the new method, as tis called, the, the Suttonian, as they profess to practice on. I hope to give you a good account when I write next, but our eyes are very weak, and the doctor is not fond of either writing or reading for his patients. But I must transgress a little. I received a letter from you by Wednesday, post 7th of July, and though I think it a choice one in the literary way, containing many useful hints and judicious observations, which will greatly assist me in the future instruction of our little ones, yet it lacked some essential ingredients to make it complete. Not one word 
respecting yourself, your health, or your present situation. My anxiety for your welfare will never leave me but with my parting breath. Tis of more importance to me than all this world contains besides. The cruel separation to which I am necessitated cuts off half of the enjoyments of life. The other half are comprised in the hope that I have that what I do and what I suffer may be serviceable to you, to our little ones, and to our country. I must beseech you, therefore, for the future, never to omit what is so essential to my happiness. Last Thursday, after hearing a very good sermon, I went with the multitude into King Street to hear the Proclamation for Independence read and proclaimed. Some field pieces with the train were brought there, and the troops appeared under arms, and all the inhabitants assembled there. The smallpox prevented many thousands from the country. When Colonel Crafts read from the balcona of the State House the proclamation, great attention was given to every word. As soon as he ended, the cry from the balcona was, God save our American states. And then three cheers which rended the air, the bells rang, the privateers fired, the forts and batteries, the cannons were discharged, the platoons followed, and every face appeared joyful. Mr. Bowden then gave a statement of sentiment, stability, and perpetuity to American independence. After dinner, the king's arms were taken down from the state house, and every vestige of him from every place in which it appeared, and burnt in King Street. Thus ends royal authority in this state, and all the people shall say, Amen. I've been a little surprised that we collect no better accounts with regard to the horrid conspiracy at New York, and that so little mention has been made of it here. It has made a talk for a few days, but now seemed all hushed in silence. The Tories say it was not a conspiracy, but an association, and pretend that there was no plot to assassinate the general. Even their hardened hearts blush feel the discovery. We have in George a match for a Borgia and a Catiline, a wretch callous to every humane feeling. Our worthy preacher told us that he believed one of the great sins which a righteous God has come out in judgment against us was our bigoted attachment to so wicked a man. May our repentance be sincere. Monday morning, July 22nd. I omitted many things yesterday in order to be better informed. I have got Mr. Cranch to inquire and write you concerning a French schooner from Martinico, which came in yesterday in a prize from Ireland. My own infirmities prevent my writing. A most excruciating pain in my head and every limb and joint, I hope, pretends a speedy eruption and prevents my saying more than that I am forever yours. The children are not yet broke out. Tis the eleventh day with us. To Abigail, from John Adams, 29th of July. How are you all this morning? Sick, weak, faint, in pain, or pretty well recovered? By this time, you are well acquainted with the smallpox. Pray, how do you like it? We have no news. It is very hard that half a dozen or half a score armies can't supply us with news. We have a famine, a perfect dearth of this necessary article. I am, at this present writing, perplexed and plagued with two knotty problems in politics. You love to pick a political bone, so I will even throw it to you. If a confederation should take place, one great question is how we shall vote, whether each colony shall count one or whether each shall have a weight in proportion to its number or wealth, or exports and imports, or a compound ratio of all. Another is whether Congress shall have authority to limit the dimensions of each colony, to prevent those which claim by charter, or proclamation, or commission, to the South Sea from growing too great and powerful, so as to be dangerous to the rest. Shall I write you a sheet upon each of these questions? When you are well enough to read, and I can find leisure enough to write, Perhaps I may. Gary carried with him a canister for you, but he is an old bachelor, and what is worse, a politician, and what is worse still, a kind of soldier. 
so that I suppose he will have so much curiosity to see armies and fortifications and assemblies that you will lose many a fine breakfast at a time when you want them most. Tell Betsy that this same Gary is such another as herself. Sex accepted. How is my brother and friend Cranch? How is his other self and their little selves and ours? Don't be in the dumps, above all things. I am hard put to it to keep out of them when I look at home. But I will be gay if I can. Adieu. To John from Abigail Adams, Boston, July 29th, 1776. I write you now, thanks be to heaven, free from pain and good spirits, but weak and feeble. All my sufferings produced but one eruption. I think I can have no reason to be doubtful with regard to myself, as the symptoms run so high and my arm operated in the best manner. The smallpox acts very oddly this season. There are seven out of our number that have not yet had it. Three out of our four children have been twice inoculated. Two of them, Charles and Tommy, have not had one symptom. I've indulged them in rather freer living than before and hope they will not long remain doubtful. Mrs. Cranch and Cotton Tufts have been in town almost three weeks and have had the inoculation repeated four times and cannot make it take. So is Mrs. Lincoln. Lucy Cranch and Billy are in the same state. Becky Peck, who has lived in the same manner with us, has it to such a degree as to be blind with one eye, swelled prodigiously. I believe she has 10,000. She is really an object to look at, though she is not Mr. Bullfinch's patient. Johnny has it exactly as one would wish, enough to be well satisfied and not be troublesome. We are ordered to get all the air we can, and when we cannot walk, we must ride, and if we can neither walk nor ride, we must be led. We sleep with windows open all night and lay upon the carpet or straw beds. Mattress or anything hard, abstain from spirit, salt, and fats. Fruit we eat, all we can get, and those who like vegetables unseasoned may eat them. But that is not I. This doubtful business is very disagreeable, as it will detain us much longer. But there are several instances now of persons who thought they had had it, and were recovered, and lived away freely, and now are plentifully dealt by. Mr. Joseph Edwards' wife, for one, and queer work she makes of it, you may be sure. The doctors say they cannot account for it, unless the free perspiration throws it off. Every physician has a number of patients in this doubtful state. Where it does take and the patient lives anything free, they have a dose of it. Cool weather is much fitter for the smallpox. I have not got rid of any terrors of the smallpox, but that of not being liable to it again, which you will say is a very great one. But what I mean is that I should dread it more now than before I saw it were I liable to it. If we consider the great numbers who have it now, computed at 7,000, 3,000 of which are from the country, tis very favorable, though not so certain as it was last winter with many patients. Mr. Shaw, who was inoculated at the same time when I and three of my children were out of the same box, and has lived lower by his account than we have, has a full portion of it for all of us. There is no accounting for it. We did not take so much physic as many others neither. If this last does not take, I shall certainly try them with some wine. Dr. Sawyer of Newburyport lost a child nine years old last week with a distemper, and Colonel Robinson of Dorchester lies extremely bad with a mortification in his kidneys. Some such instances we must expect among a variety of persons and constitutions. I rejoice exceedingly at the success which General Lee has met with. I believe the men will come along in a short time. They are raising, but the Massachusetts has been drained for sea service as well as land. The men were procured in this town last week. We have taken a vessel from Halifax bound to New York, which we should call a prize, but that it contained about 14 Tories, among whom is that infamous wretch of a Ben Davis, the gingerbread robber. How many little ones can say I was hungry and you gave me no bread, but inhumanely took what little I had from me? 
I wish the sea or any other element had them rather than that we should be tormented with them. Friends and connections are very bad things in such times as these. Interest will be made and impartial justice obstructed. We catch flies and let the wasps go. Hark a general huzzah for, of the populace. These wretches are just committed to jail. The continental troops are all near gone from this town. All, I believe, who are in a marching state. The smallpox has been general amongst them and exceedingly favorable. I have requested of Judge Cushing to write you an account of his circuit, and he has promised to do it. Both he and his lady are under inoculation. When I came into town, I was in great hopes that if we did well, we should be able to return in about three weeks, and we should have been able to have effected it if it had operated as formerly. Now I fear it will be five weeks before we shall all get through, but I must not complain. When I cast my eye upon Becky, whose symptoms were not half so high as mine or some of the rest of us, and see what an object she is, I am silenced and adore the goodness of God toward us. Her doctor says she is not dangerous. Colonel Warren has suffered as much pain as I did, but he has more to show for it, for he is very cleverly spattered. Mrs. Warren is now struggling with it. To one of her constitution, it operates in faintings and languor. It did so upon Betsy Cranch, yet when it found its way through, it operated kindly. I believe you will be tired of hearing of smallpox, but you bid me write every post and suppose you are anxious to hear how we have it. The next post I hope to tell you that they all have it who now remain uncertain. I am at all times and in all states unfeignedly yours. To John Adams from Abigail Adams, Boston, July 30th, 1776. I wrote you by the post, but as Captain Kedzo goes tomorrow, perhaps this may reach you first. As to myself, I am comfortable. Johnny is cleverly. Nabby, I hope, has gone through the distemper. The eruption was so trifling that to be certain I have had inoculation repeated. Charles and Tommy have neither had symptoms nor eruption. Charles was inoculated last Sabbath evening a second time. Tommy today, the third time from some fresh matter taken from Becky Peck, who has enough for all the house besides. This suspense is painful. I know not what to do with them. It lengthen out, lengthens out the time which I can but ill afford, and if they can have it, I know not how to quit until I can get them through. Youth, youth is the time. They have no pains but bodily, no anxiety of mind, no fears for themselves or others, and then the disease is much lighter. The poor doctor is as anxious as we are, but begs us to make certain if repeated inoculations will do it. There are now several patients who were inoculated last winter and thought they had passed through the distemper, but now they have taken it in the natural way. Mrs. Cranch and two of her children are in this uncertain state, with a great number of others which I could mention. Tis a pestilence that walketh in darkness. Mrs. Warren, with whom I was yesterday, lay in the whole state little better than non-existence. I greatly feared that she would not survive it, but today she is revived and many pox appear upon her. But tis a poor business at the best, where I entertained one terror before, I do ten now. The season of the year is very unfit for the distemper. The tone of every person's vessels are relaxed, very little spring in the air, and the medicine too powerful for weak constitutions. I hope to be properly thankful that I and mine are so far comfortable through, let's say, I hope to be properly thankful that I and mine are so far so comfortable through. I think I have all my difficulty to grapple with alone and separate from my earthly prop and support. I begin to long again for the sweet air of Braintree, and the time to come will be much longer than the time past. Pray let, let Mr. Hancock know that I have availed myself of his kind offer so far as to send for some fruit from his garden. Everything here bears such a prize as would surprise you to behold. The gentry were very kind enough to cut down a number of my uncle's fruit trees last winter, and have cut up his current bushes, 
but we have had kind friends. Mrs. Newell has been exceedingly so. Pray make my regards to the President's lady, and tell her since she balked me of the wedding cake to which I laid claim by promise, I expect she will remember me upon another occasion, which I hear is like to take place. Oh, my dear friend, you know how I feel when I look back upon a long absence. I look forward to the thought that the year is but half spent. I often recollect those lines, O ye gods, annihilate but space and time, and make two lovers happy. Yours, Abigail Adams. Thank you so much for joining me, and have a very happy 4th of July.